Hey everybody, I'm Michael Klein. Welcome to another East Oak Studio live stream session. Today we're going to be talking about the importance of setting up your palette and how to clean it. Uh, to me, I think the palette is one of the most overlooked instruments in painting because people kind of assume that you can grab whatever material you want, uh, start painting on it, and it won't affect the process. Um, there, there are no rules. Uh, you can use whatever you want, but there are certain things that happen during the process that uh, allow you to kind of have an easy workflow. So just to quickly kind of describe the palettes that I have in front of me, um, this one off to the left is by a company called New Wave. Uh, it's, I think it's the uh, Confidant palette or, or something of that sort. I can't remember if it's the bigger one or the smaller one. It's really beautiful, nice hardwood. It doesn't bend. It's uh, handmade in Pennsylvania. Uh, I believe their website is newwave.com. Um, this one was mine that I had traced from my instructor, Jacob Collins, and then I had it made uh, by a violin maker. Uh, and he uh, had glued together a couple layers of uh, door skin. So uh, that's a particularly nice palette for me. It has not only uh, some memories attached to it, but it's just it's a nice wood. Uh, this one was gifted to me by a friend and she purchased it in Paris at the Sennelier store. And it's, it's quite nice, very tiny, uh, comfortable palette. So all of those things are important when you're thinking about how to select the palette. Uh, another thing that we're gonna do today is we're gonna announce the winner of Alex Venezia's live stream uh, still life class that's happening every Monday night here at the studio. Uh, if you are not familiar with it, Check out the website and you can register there. There are three sessions left, I believe. Um, you can always get access to the class after you purchase it, but you can't uh, purchase it afterward because it's only for the students who are watching. And we also have uh, Carlo Russo's live stream coming up, so that's another thing to check out. So getting into it, I want to talk a little bit about um, just quickly kind of before you get into um, the surface or the, the absorption rate. Uh, I just want to talk about the setup of my palette, the colors. It's important to always do the same thing every time so when you pick up your instrument it's not like picking up something that you've never played before. It's, it, you're very used to it. You don't have to think uh, about wh where your hand is going, what you're doing. So uh, on my setup I have this idea of thinking, conceiving of the color wheel. Uh, so on the lower left I have the three uh, least saturated primary colors. So I have raw umber, burnt umber, and ivory black. So uh, that will be uh, very helpful to understand once I get the white out and I can talk a little bit about opening up these colors. So I put my white on the right at the top. So there you can see I have three primary colors in their least saturated state and, and the brightest, lightest white. Um, so typically I mix with a brush, but today I'm gonna mix with the palette knife. So each one of these things has a local color to it. So the, uh, I use raw umber for these colors because each brand has a different kind of shift and the hue can fluctuate so you can get, say, you may have a romber that is a neutral green. So you don't want that. This is a, this is a neutral yellow. Okay, and then so you come over and you mix the burnt umber and you realize how kind of pink it is. So that's how I look at my uh, neutral red. And then moving up into the black, which is obviously the blue. So there, if you can get a sense of how you get down to the neutral colors without having to mix all of your neutrals. So often they talk about taking your yellow and mixing it with the complement, violet, and getting a neutral. But in this case, it's way easier just to shoot down to the center of the, this idea of a color sphere and color operating in three dimension so that you can get to a neutral yellow very quickly. Now, on the flip side of that, uh, if you think all the way up to the, the uh, most intense kind of 
pure color or uh, highest chroma or highest intensity, however you want to term it. Um, essentially, if you take yellow and spread it out and you glaze it over a white surface or any surface on, on your palette or painting, that's going to spread the paint thin and that's going to be your, your highest chroma uh, color. And then beyond that, if you add white, then it loses chroma and it gets into a higher value. So um, I'm saying all this stuff quickly because it's just it's a matter of kind of understanding the systems and how color works. But as you get used to it and you're in a flow, it's very helpful to know all these things because then it allows you to express yourself easier. Um, you can get into the poetry of painting as opposed to the technical stuff. So that's uh, where I really want to take this. So you can think about this being this instrument that you always refer to and you have to ha uh, have kind of a reverence for it and um, a s sensibility and respect for it. So orange, okay, so on my palette I have the, the two lightest most chromatic colors up towards the top because as you are getting more light reflected back to your eye uh, it's more chromatic and so when that light drops off of the form it becomes more neutral. So then I'm going to go from my uh, warm oranges over into my uh, reds and, and violets. So on my palette I have um, I've excluded cad red so it goes um, cadmium orange, burnt sienna, alizarin crimson, magenta, so let's see, so this is alizarin, magenta, and then uh, cobalt violet, cobalt blue, and then into the ultramarine blue. So, so there you can see the arrangement and the organization of the colors. Uh, yeah, the light blue. Now the dark blue. So if I got into a little bit more mixing, you'd be able to see how all of these... Actually, Louis, can you hand me a brush? I think it'll be a little bit easier. Any brush over there is fine. Um, it'll be a little bit easier to understand because this looks kind of muddy. So those are the three neutrals. Thanks, buddy. So I'm going to get rid of those, and I'm going to create a string for you to see how I think of the um, from the neutral yellow up to the high chroma yellow. So I've added raw sienna there because that's a dark. That's in between. So essentially, I'm taking the raw umber, and then. Uh, Raw umber, then I move up into the raw sienna. So you can see this kind of transition wanting to move up into the light. On my palette, I always mix from the dark to the light. So it's like if you're, if you're playing guitar, you know, you're moving your hand up and down the, the neck of the guitar, changing the notes, and it's just it's a system. And you, you can get into a song and not have to think about it. So that's, that's massively important when you're thinking about painting. So many people don't uh, relate these things to kind of a, a systematic approach because with impressionism everything was kind of uh, more gut reaction. So then I go into workshops and you see just kind of, you see everything. You see uh, people, uh, you know, their palette is dry and dirty and all these things. So uh, I'll do the blue really quickly. So the blue would be black, ultramarine blue, cobalt, and the cobalt mixed with the white and then for the really light light I would choose to mix back into the ultramarine blue with uh, a lot of white. So you see that's the scale going down into the neutrals. So that's basically how I'm interconnecting the palette and always thinking about these things on a sliding scale from uh, a less chromatic to high chroma up towards the top right. So whatever I'm looking at, if I'm painting a flower and it's, it's falling away from 
the light, I'm just immediately going left on my palette and I'll hit the notes that are kind of the notes that oftentimes harmonize with the background. And then as the pedal is either the light's passing through it or light is hit bouncing off of it, then I move up to my right and uh, get those higher notes. Now with cleanup of your palette, um, you can uh, save the colors so you can put them on a different palette, the palette that you're going to use the next day or uh, put them in the fridge. That's often what people do so they don't form a skin. Um, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. You can store it with clove oil. So that's basically you don't want to throw away all that fresh paint, especially the magenta and cobalt violet. So I'll get this cleaned off. And the idea here is that you want to, you, you basically leave kind of a, uh, um, you know, you don't have to worry about getting all the paint off because as you start to cure this wood and treat it and you're incorporating more oil and more paint, all of your colors together on your palette, this is a rainbow and essentially what you want to do is make uh, a neutral, so all of the colors kind of would then make uh, what is commonly known as mud or just a, a neutral brown. So I would take a little bit of uh, turpentine and just lift up that and then towards the end of the process I like to take a little bit of oil to so see there it was a little bit heavy on the yellow so I'll just press a little bit harder to lift that up. And then you can take a little bit of oil. This is oleo gel from, from Rublev. And so I take the oil at the very end, then I just press it in into the wood. So there you can see, you can get kind of a, a, a nice sheen to it. So then the next day when you come in, your, your paint isn't going to absorb into the wood. That's, that's the really frustrating thing is you want your paint to, to stay on the surface and then your, uh, you don't lose that oil that's going into your wood. So that's the demonstration. Uh, that's basically how I set up and clean my palette every day. I want to quickly announce the winner to, uh, we had a contest a couple weeks ago that was for Alex's class, so we'll be contacting you. Uh, we randomly drew uh, Mustafa Mahmoud. So Mustafa, congratulations, you won the, the last uh, giveaway we did of Alex's live stream. Again, if you are not familiar with any of these classes, we, we do this as an opportunity for you guys could, to learn about the live stream format that we're offering. and. Uh, to be able to kind of understand how it works. You can always access it after you purchase it, but oftentimes we stop selling the, the class or workshop due to um, wanting to keep it fresh and um, allowing the artists to keep their wor uh, workshop network going and not have any competition. So check out our classes, info at eastoakstudio.com. Uh, if you like these videos, please share them. Um, share them with friends, families, artists, whatever, and uh, we'll see you next time.